For those who aren't here, I'm Joe Green. I'm Graham Boyd. Uh, and we uh, together run a group called the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative, um, which formed a little over two years ago. Uh, Emmett sitting there is part of our group. Um, and what the reason we exist is to try to provide the necessary funding for psychedelics to become legal medicines. Uh, I know when I sort of started to find out about this work a couple years ago, maybe many of you had this experience of like, holy shit, psychedelics could change the world, but that'll never happen. But wait, they're going through the FDA. All right, but I'm sure there's nothing I can do to help. And then started to realize sort of how shockingly it is that this important work has been so dramatically underfunded. Uh, Rick Doblin, at the last MAPS board meeting, Rick Doblin's salary just went up from 100 to $110,000 a year, which is pretty crazy considering he's doing this since 1986. Um, that kind of dedication, we had a, I said this story before, I don't know if you guys were all here, we had an event hosted by a, a major tech CEO and he's like, guys, we should give this guy money just because he's been working on it so long. Like, we do something for six months and we're like, eh, it's not working, let's do something else. Like, what was year 17 like for Rick Doblin? Um, and so our group came together um, in order to basically bring philanthropists together uh, in order to um, fund this important work. Cool, so I'm interested in who's in the room here because Joe and I talked about you know, what we could talk about. And I'm actually gonna just jump down and go around a little bit and ask you to say something about why you are interested in Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative. Um, and don't be shy. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, working in climate change and technology, specifically software technology. And I've just seen these industries go on and on, and I think uh, they need a perspective change. And so um, part of the work I wanna do is set up a psychedelic retreat to trip founders and CEOs of businesses, and as well as climate change leaders. Thank you. Thank you. And what's your name? Ryan. Great. If, Somebody if you else, why are, you, why are you here right now? I'm a student of consciousness. Awesome. And what is it about a, a philanthropic group that's funding psychedelics that has you in the room here? Uh, I'm not here for that purpose. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, go ahead. For the last three years, I've been working on a harm reduction and peer support application, um, trying to find a way to get it funded properly and without conflicts of interest. Great, okay, so we got a couple of people who are doing work that uh, they have a vision and they're interested in kind of how that's gonna get funded, it sounds like. I lead a foundation focused on mental health and well-being, and we give grants to traditional healing modalities that don't add up for addressing the kind of trauma that so many have faced. And so we're interested in expanding beyond the kind of things that typically get paid for by insurance companies and states to have care of this kind part of treatment. Cool, awesome. So as I make my way over there, Joe, maybe you can speak a little bit to how part of what we're trying to do is figure out how to be a resource to all the people who are funding in this area. Um, that, that, you know, some people don't want to necessarily figure it out from the very beginning. Some people do, but talk about a little bit how we do that, and I'm gonna walk over here and find some other people. Yeah, we, we are a a somewhat unusual organization in the world of philanthropy. It's just myself and Graham, we're both volunteers. We have one uh, paid person, his name is Ben. He's here elsewhere. Um, and so we're a collaborative, which means we do a few things. We, we develop a perspective on what we think the biggest priorities are in psychedelic medicine. We go out and recruit uh, folks to join our group. Um, but then we also have people come to us and uh, say, hey, I'm interested in this particular area of psychedelics. Like we had a guy I got introduced to recently whose uh, grandfather, sorry, whose uncle was a famous psychedelic researcher. He had never taken psychedelics. He's involved at Stanford and said, I would like to do research on creativity with psychedelics at Stanford, very specific. So Graham and I worked together to go figure out, is there psychedelic research happening at Stanford? Turns out the answer is no. Are there people interested? Turns out the answer is yes. 
can we try to connect those people? Um, but one of our core theories of change is that getting one psychedelic substance approved through the FDA is a real threshold change. And so while there are several different substances that are being worked on, uh, MDMA and psilocybin are the ones that are the, are the furthest along. And MDMA, we think, is a couple years at least ahead of psilocybin. So we've put, so, so to speak, a lot of the wood behind that arrow um, with the idea that if it does get approved, then all the normal sources of funding, foundations, the government, et cetera, will unlock. And so it's a very unique uh, area of philanthropy where, in my experience, a lot of philanthropists are looking for a combination of how do I have a huge, like, upstream impact that changes the world? Uh, how do I find something that actually is a reasonable chance of working, of actually succeeding, and we've got the FDA path, but that's somehow underfunded? And those things don't usually come together. When something works, usually it has funding. So this is a rare example because of the controversial nature of psychedelics. And so we, our team, and we have a whole network of experts uh, in the pharmaceutical space, many of them we have brought to work with MAPS to help them think about not only how do they get the drug approved, but actually how do they get it in, as a medicine into the world. Because it's not just a drug, it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, which is an entirely new modality of care. Yeah, and so let me riff on that a little bit too, and then I'm gonna come over to you. So. It, you know, MAPS over its history has done an extraordinary job of finding volunteers who have specific skill sets. People who know how to do certain things, they volunteer some of their time, and have essentially grown from being a tiny advocacy organization to a pharmaceutical company, a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. And a lot of that has been by volunteers and people who are sort of contributing knowledge about one thing or another, and then plucking people from um, the pharmaceutical industry, Novartis in particular, to staff those positions. One of the things that's been really interesting over the last year as we've been able to bring in more resources is that we've also been able to hire consultants, people who are you know, consultants to, to medium-sized pharma companies and figure out how to do commercialization. Um, somebody who you know, used to work for Pfizer who's brought several of the big name pharmaceuticals through. So there's just this sort of coming together and in some ways professionalizing of an organization while keeping its really you know, nifty, great, scrappy spirit. So let's talk to a couple of other people from the audience. Why are you here? Uh, thank you for hosting us. I got to see Rick Doblin speak today. It was, it was awesome. Um, so we talked about a lot of the updates and progress that's been made, but what I want to understand as well is like what we can do. So like I volunteer for Maps Canada, um, helping with some sort of like analytics and stuff like that. But um, there's so many engaged, like enthusiastic people with, on social who got great with social media technology, and we're trying to figure out like what can we do to push this through, not necessarily through medical, but just for advocacy in general. I think what, what one of the biggest things which might seem kind of mundane, is that one of the most expensive and difficult parts of clinical trials is recruiting uh, the volunteers to be in the trials. And you might think, wow, this is this miracle cure for PTSD, it's super hard to cure. But it's actually been slower than expected, which always happens with clinical trials, to recruit the volunteers to be in the MAPS trials. And they need to have um, severe PTSD, they need to have a number of different criteria. Um, can they, do you remember what the new website is? For, for the volunteer, the volu for like people who want to be in the trial that they unveiled at the board meeting. We should remember the website, but they, they built a really nice new front end, which for people who have the ability to get stuff out on the internet, it again, sounds kind of trivial, but figuring out how to actually get enough people in the pipeline to be in the trials is in one of many ways the most important thing. Like phase three, the final phase is happening. It's going well, the sites are online but it's expensive and slow to actually recruit the people uh, to come into the trials. We're gonna hear from one more person. So I'm here because I think what you're doing is unbelievably important, both in terms of what you're funding, but almost more than that, there are a lot of significant philanthropists or potential philanthropists and very high net worth individuals who either aren't comfortable coming out of the closet, if you will, and supporting psychedelics, even though they've had incredibly important life-changing experiences, or don't have the time or bandwidth to figure it out. And you're addressing both of those, which I think is brilliant and incredibly important. Thank you for that. And, and so that you can spread the word to others and give some specifics here, we are a 501c3 
nonprofit organization. People can donate, of course, directly to MAPS, but what some people choose to do is to donate to PSFC and retain their anonymity in doing so. And so it's both a, a, a way to do that and also a way to, as you say, to gather um, you know, resources and knowledge for the philanthropist who's not familiar with all of that. Right. This so, dynamic is hilarious, unplanned, of like me standing on the stage and you sort of like roaming the crowd. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, it's a pleasure, Joe. So I'm, I'm curious how many of you, let's do a little show of hands, how many of you right now are doing work in the psychedelic space and, um, and you're part of an organization that is in need of funding? And how many of you are involved in philanthropy, either as part of a foundation, as a donor, as an advisor to a donor? How many of you are in that world? Great. And how so many of you, you are should on all psychedelics know. right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it, this is exactly the mix of people that we hope to have. Um, we, you know, we're interested in being a resource to philanthropists and, and honestly having more people join what is now a relatively small community. For people who don't want to actually be part of PSFC formally, we want to be able to be an advisor to, to folks who are doing that. And if you're doing work that's really cool and, um, and deserving of funding, we want to know about that too. But, but as Joe said before, we really are focused on funding the clinical research and now the sort of rolling out of patient care for PTSD worldwide because we believe that's going to be the first psychedelic substance that makes it through regulatory approval and becomes available. Once that happens, then you can apply to the Gates Foundation or to NIH or to all the other sort of normal funders who have their doors closed right now. So that's our strategy. That being said, we made a small grant to fund the training of therapists of color for MAPS. Um, we're actively looking at the psilocybin research that's going on. And so I would really encourage you to come up to Joe or me and just you know, talk about what you're up to because we're wanting to get educated about that. And one, I think, you know, one of the other areas that's probably, I was touching on a moment before, are gonna be the most challenging is how do we actually scale up this treatment? So when most new drugs come out, it's a drug, it gets sold at Walgreens, there's a system for that. But this is almost more like a new surgical procedure coming out or a new medical device, which is what the FDA is approving is not MDMA, it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And the current MAPS protocol, for those who don't know, it's two therapists, three MDMA sessions, and a total of about 100 hours of therapy with two therapists. Um, the estimate is it'll probably cost about $15,000, we're working hard to make sure insurance covers that. But uh, right now there is, and it's about a, a hundred hours of training to become a MAPS uh, licensed therapist and they have a very limited number of people they can train. And so one of the biggest challenges is how do we scale from only a few hundred people that are now currently trained to the probably tens of thousands of them that are going to be needed for the, uh, to treat everybody who has PTSD. And, um, you know, it's one of the things we spent a lot of time at the MAPS board meeting talking about was, you know, when this comes out, hopefully there will be a, you know, a lot of attention and a lot of people wanting help. And unfortunately, on the current ramp, there will be 600 therapists ready uh, when it comes out. And that's not very many considering that 8 million or so Americans with PTSD. That's also something just for people to really be thinking about is, and also as a real job opportunity is, I mean, we think this is a total revolution in mental health. There's a guy named Ben Sessa, who was mentioned earlier, who is a British researcher doing MDMA for alcoholism trial. And he had this really great explanation. Uh, he was at the Esalen Psychedelic Conference and was saying that one way to understand addiction is imagine you're a small child and you don't know when your mother comes in the room if they're gonna hit you or hug you. And your amygdala, your fear center becomes overactive and it's constantly firing and so you never feel safe. And so for the first time when you drink alcohol or try some other substance, you feel safe for the first time. And so mostly what, what he said to me is, where we are with mental health is where physiological health was in 1900. Well, we understand how to treat some symptoms, we understand some of the epi epidemiology, but we really don't treat the root causes. And one of the things that's so exciting about psychedelics for people in the mental health world is it's an opportunity to actually treat the root causes, to treat the trauma um, that's underlying a lot of these other, what we think about as separate conditions that are probably very related to each other. And so thinking about this just as a 
wholesale change in mental health and the entire way that new, uh, new, psychedel new clinics, new modalities, and also maybe shifting away from just a medical diagnostic model, which is what's wrong with you, let's fix you. It's like binary, you're sick or you're well, to a model of like everybody's on a path. Yes, with the bloody shark shirt. Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, uh, so Rick talked about this before, so I won't do as good of a job, and I'm happy to try, which is, the, the basic idea is that if you're traumatized, trying to talk about your trauma with a therapist is very difficult, because you you're becoming re-traumatized. When you try to bring up the horrible thing or things that happened to you, your fear center is so overactive that you can't, uh, you basically can't talk about it. And so, for any of you who maybe have ever taken MDMA, possibly, um, your amygdala gets quieted down. And so what, what a session looks like is you have the two therapists that an eight hour session, the, the, the MDMA sessions, they have before and after kind of talk therapy integration sessions. And people, it's often very challenging. Uh, it's not like all lovey-dovey, like it's very challenging stuff coming up for people. And about half the time their eyes are closed with eye masks, but half the time they're talking. So they're talking a lot. The therapist might encourage them to go inward, and if they've been inward for a while, they might encourage them to talk. Um, but it's really this idea of uh, inner-directed healing. The trade name that they're, so when you put a drug through, there's the, the trade name, right? What you sell the drug as, right? There's ibuprofen and there's Advil. So what they're going for is Empath. Hi, Rick Doblin. Um, and uh, so the idea is it's, it's inner-directed therapy. Um, I'm explaining how, psych how MDMA therapy works, Rick, so I'm gonna feel very uh, on the spot right now. Um, yes, I do know how it works. Um, and yeah, the idea is that, that you're really bringing out the inner healer, like the same way if you have a cut, you don't like cognitively know how to heal your cut, it just happens. And so the idea is the psyche also has self-healing properties, and so this allows those self-healing properties to come out. Um, and it's really beautiful if you watch, and, Rick had mentioned before, there's a movie called Trip of Compassion that's being screened here, I think, 9 o'clock on Thursday, um, which is probably the best film of, like, what it, it's, it's three Israelis going through the treatment. And for me, I, I went, got a chance to go through the training session. You see people go from, like, lights off to lights on. Like, you see somebody at the beginning, and it just looks like they're kind of dead inside. And by the end, it's, they're alive again. It, it's, it's really remarkable. Another thing that, uh, and I'll go to the next question, that I found kind of tragic and fascinating is that most of the people who have PTSD from warfare, it turns out also have childhood trauma. So we have a volunteer army, which means you have a lot of folks from, uh, from lower income backgrounds who are more likely to have trauma. And so it's not random, like a bunch of people might be in the same incident in war, and some of them are gonna get traumatized and some are not, and it, tends to turn out it's those who have childhood trauma. So what, one thing I wanted to bring in is, is expanded access. How many of you know what expanded access is or have heard of it? So it, it's a little bit less than half the room. It, there's, there's a um, period of time before the FDA approves MDMA, which is still two or three years down the road, best case scenario, a period of time in which therapists are able to provide MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to people outside of the clinical trials. So the admission criteria are a little bit looser, and the clinic, it's not for gathering clinical data, so you don't have a, a possibility of a placebo. You're simply getting the treatment. And this is something that, that as PSFC, we're excited about because we want to make sure that the people who can most benefit for this aren't barred because of economic status. So, so we're setting up a scholarship fund for people to be able to have access to expanded access. Now, we don't know yet how many people it's going to be. Unfortunately, FDA initially has said it's a very few number of people. But if that goes well, it's our expectation that it will grow, it will be more people. And this will be kind of the beta test. This will be the opportunity to see how do you set up a, 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 a practice where you're providing this therapy if you're a practitioner. How do you um, potentially, could you ask for insurance reimbursement, Rick? Or is there no chance of that? Yeah. 
So, so trying out that, talking to insurance companies and seeing if they will cover the talk therapy pieces of that. But we want to make sure that it's not just an opportunity for people who are already economically able to afford this, but really for everybody. So when one, one exciting thing about expanded access, I see we have my friend Shai here visiting from Israel. And uh, the Israeli government's really been ahead of the curve. And um, they put up a $500,000 matching grant to fund 50 expanded access patients. And uh, Ron Beller, who's part of PSFC, has raised 425000 of that, so we're almost done. And that'll allow Israel to be the first country in the world where the government is going to fund. Uh, and it, you know, it might seem crazy, right? Like the, the VA spends $17 billion a year, the American VA, on disability payments for people with PTSD. So you would think this would be a no-brainer to fund. Uh, and if you come tomorrow uh, at 1 o'clock, Rachel Yehuda will be speaking, who's at the Bronx VA, and can t you can hear more about the challenges of bringing something like this through the VA. Um, but it's, it's really been amazing to see what's been happening around the world. Um, and just as, as a Jew, I love seeing the Israeli government. Uh, it's a very traumatized place, to put it mildly. So I want to mention one other thing that we're up to, which is around um, research on communications. So we believe that as MDMA and psilocybin and other uh, forms of therapy become more available as the FDA moves towards approval, there's going to be more and more publicity around this. There are going to be more and more media stories. I mean, you've seen that already. And how it gets discussed is going to be a big piece of how people end up receiving it. We don't want to have the sort of backlash of the 60s counterculture. We want this to be something that is received with open arms by the American public. So we funded research and polling, and, it's, and one of the things we found, and Tom Eckert is, is here, who is one of the sponsors of the Oregon Psilocybin Services Initiative of 2020. Thank you, Tom. And Ooh, let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. And so one of the things that is interesting is that, the, is that the public, so far, according to our research, is much more nervous about the notion of, of anything that looks like legalizing psilocybin. And of course, decriminalizing isn't the same thing as legalizing, but, but the sort of you know, movement towards decriminalizing psilocybin, decriminalizing nature, I believe in that wholeheartedly, but it's also worth noticing that that has some sort of public opinion resistance to it. What Tom and his partner Cherie are doing is a model of setting up by ballot initiative, if, if it passes, not if, when it passes in November 2020, will create in Oregon um, state licensing for psilocybin therapy, not just with medical diagnosis, but for everyone. With lots of safeguards and safety. And if you, uh, if you come back for the last talk of the week on Saturday at 5, Graham will be speaking more about this effort. Um, I think, right? Yeah, for sure. And Tom and Tom and Cherie will as well. So we, we only have a few more minutes, unfortunately, for our rather short panel. So we can probably take like one or two questions before we have and to And I'm going to bring up. the mic out because we've got this awesome music and we wouldn't be able to hear you otherwise. Who has a question? Okay, I'll go back here and then I'll come over to you. Hi, I don't know if you can speak to this, but uh, from the talk earlier with the Mercers and the Cokes and Soros funding this kind of stuff, I, I mean, to me, you know, I don't really understand these people, I understand, but it's just surreal, and I was hoping you could shed some light on what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about that. Rick, I'm sure can too. Um, look, I think this is something that was really brilliant that Rick did, which is... I mean, it's sort of, I don't want to make this sound unduly calculating because PTSD patients are a deeply needy, needy population, but it's also veterans are rightly one of the most sympathetic groups in our country. The feeling, you know, you've, you've served your country. We have Randy back here who has uh, served his country and has been undergoing um, MDMA therapy. And um, I mean, something I sort of cannot imagine doing. Um, and I'm grateful that I have not had to. Um, but, you know, when we've done our polling, we've seen that sort of, of all the possible groups, and we ask about a bunch of different numbers, that uh, veterans are the people, basically whatever you want for veterans. Um, and so, you know, the folks who have, from the right, who have supported, uh, I think it's been, the, the, the biggest 10 peg has been around veterans. And um, as, as Rick said before, 
Um, Rebecca Mercer's money was specifically about veterans, and luckily uh, enough people in the study are veterans that, that that's able to fund it. I was talking to Rachel Yehuda earlier, who's at the VA, and members of Congress, it's basically impossible for them to be like, don't do that thing that obviously helps veterans. And so I think that's been this opportunity. Also, you're seeing you know, a lot of great bipartisanship in ending the drug war. I mean, the Kochs were big supporters of the recent criminal justice reform. I mean, I'm not like a uh, across the board Koch fan, uh, but that's been really great to see. And I think there's been a sense across the aisle that the drug war is a total and complete failure. Um, and that these things like PTSD, like opioid addiction, are often disproportionately hitting some of the more conservative areas of the country. Um, yeah, take our last here. question. Oh, thank you so much. Um, oh, one thing that I've been wondering is I've started to see some of my friends and I, I myself wanting to advocate more for this and even like post on, you know, post on social media, you know, podcasting and all this stuff. And I'm wondering, like, we don't want to have this, um, you know, clamp down again that we saw in the 70s on the war on drugs. And I'm trying to figure out how, you know, is could we do like a voice guidelines or brand voice or just like a, a set of, you know, something sets for when we're sharing um, that we stay in line and still say, um, so we don't cause any trouble or look like we're, we're causing, you know, I think that's really important. I'm trying to figure out how we could do that best. Do you want to take that, Graham? Yeah, I mean, that's a great suggestion. We, we, we are getting ready to do, you know, media training by the person who was, you know, the, the head of communications. At, uh